Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, welcome to the Paranormal Portal. Once again, it's our Saturday night show. And uh, as always, we've got two fun-filled, adventurous hours waiting for you of diving into the craziness that is the paranormal. So hope you guys are doing great, having a great weekend. Thank you so much for choosing to spend at least some of it right here with us. That's awesome. And uh, before I go any further, a special thank you to the sponsor of the Paranormal Portal, which is Cryptid Coin, ladies and gentlemen. And Cryptid Coin is a brand new cryptocurrency which uh, has its mission at the heart of the paranormal cryptid community. And by that, I mean that they are uh, taking a, a big part of the coinage and keeping it in trust and to generate grants which will be available to cryptid research teams from across the planet. So um, it's really the first real big, I think, step forward for cryptid research across the board because currently and, and primarily those researches are fundamentally encumbered and financed by the people doing them. So this is the first opportunity that I know of that there is an opportunity to put monies out there into the research community in order to ascertain or, or to get better equipment um, to be able to, uh, to finance these expeditions and uh, bring along the state-of-the-art equipment and uh, possible, you know, making it more accessible to more people. So I'm really excited about this and a special thank you to Cryptid Coin for sponsoring the Paranormal Portal. And if you want more information about either Cryptid Coin itself or uh, the to become possibly eligible for one of the grants, if you are a research team uh, yourself, head over to cryptidcoin.io for more information. It's a great opportunity to... Uh, push the needle forward encrypted investigation so uh thanks again and let's get back to the show and i suppose i should introduce my branch the first branch on my family tree mr sheldon how you doing buddy i'm doing great i am the first branch you are the first branch you need to talk a little louder though your your volume is a little quieter tonight oh boy oh boy it wouldn't be the paranormal portal without some issues at the beginning <laughs> <laughs> you sound like a seasoned hand like you're 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 well versed in all of this huh it didn't take long for you to realize that that's well, i'm uh well accustomed now well good and I, I appreciate you being here how's everything in your world it's cold cool. but it's it's good solid i mean I overall i was talking to nina today she said you got some warm weather coming though so looks like you're gonna okay, be in the good. 40s in the 40s before long but uh, and for those of you uh, in the YouTube chat, uh, Cryptid Mom, or Paranormal Portal Mom, rather, is, is uh, she's out there. <laughs> she's not a Cryptid Mom, unless cryptid I'm a Cryptid. Mom. If I'm a Cryptid, then she's a Cryptid Mom. But but Portal Mom's out there. Uh, she did something to her phone and can't chat, so she just wanted to extend her love to all of you guys, and uh, she's, she's out there listening. So, um, yeah, we got a bunch of stuff to get through tonight. Sheldon, are you about ready to dig in? I'm always ready to dig in. <laughs> it's like a buffet of fun, isn't it? That's right. All right. Well, let's get to the news then, and we'll start the ball rolling. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Paranormal Portal News Desk, where we cover all of the Paranormal Portal news that I could find. And some of it's paranormal, some of it is odd, some of it is weird, but it's all not normal, and so we're going to talk about it. Now, some of it is actually like leaps ahead in technology or some exciting developments that might be forthcoming. But uh, anyway, let's dive into the first article and see what's coming on. Uh, and this one's kind of uh, out of the conspiracy books. I don't know, you know, I don't pretend to know much about this stuff, but I'll read the article because I thought, wow, that's kind of interesting. I, I don't know I don't know much about this kind of stuff, but anyway, the first article tonight is coming from unexplained-mysteries.com, and it is CIA has been spying on Americans again. Now the no way the funny thing is is I don't know why that's news because I think it's it's pretty common knowledge that they are in the information pathways of everything anyway. So it's like. As far as I as far as I understood, and I might be completely wrong, but I, as far as I understood, they're kind of always listening uh, anymore with technology, aren't they? 
Yeah, I mean, I would think so. Isn't wasn't that something with the Patriot Act or something around those well, lines? Well, there there is that, uh, but that, I don't know if that 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 gives them a, a green light. I think to go ahead if they have reason to, uh, as far as justifying it as you know national security or whatever. But um, it just, as far as I know, that just removed the need to grab warrants and stuff for warrantless searches. But um, this. I don't know what the meat of this is. I guess we should read it and find out what they're talking about. Yeah, that's about. probably a great idea. Because <laughs> <laughs> we can speculate on what the hell they mean all, all <laughs> up front and be totally wrong here. So let's see what it says. The one researchers. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's me. The Central Intelligence Agency has reported to, reportedly been collecting data as part of a previously undisclosed program. This is my surprise face. That's not that surprised. Uh, according to the senators Ron Wyden and Mar uh, Martin Heinrich, the CIA has been covertly conducting warrantless surveillance as part of two separate data collection efforts. Eesh. Uh, this seems to have been going on both since and despite the 2013 disclosure by whistleblower Edward Snowden of mass data collection through extensive internet and phone surveillance. Until then, officials had stringently denied that this was going on, even going so far as to lie under oath. Named PRISM, the operation was ultimately deemed unlawful by U.S. courts. Now it seems as though the CIA is doing the same thing again. Oh, jeez. Uh, oh. oh, no. A uh, declassified report relating to one of the two programs was released on Thursday. However, requests to gain inf access to information about the other were refused. <laughs> you know we'd like to know more about that other program no <laughs> okay but we'd we'd like to <laughs> widen and heinrich have accused the agency of undermining democratic oversight imposing risk to the long-term credibility of the intelligence community the public deserve to know the nature and full extent of the surveillance the pair argued these reports raise serious questions about what information of ours the CIA is vacuuming up in bulk and how the agency exploits that information to spy on Americans. The American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU, said in a statement effort, or that's what they said, I guess that was the statement, sorry. Oh. <laughs> Effort, efforts to determine the full scale and purpose of this mass surveillance remain ongoing. Well... I think they're always going to be pursuing, like, you know, they're always going to be chasing that tail because I, I think, I think they kind of operate with impunity and, and, uh, they're supposed to have oversight, but they don't seem to have much oversight. And, uh, again, I don't pretend to know too much about it anyway. So, um, yes, yeah, I don't know. I, well, it's it, gotta, it, it doesn't it's surprise the idea. Me. I mean, they, they over, they oversee themselves. Like whenever there's an investigation, like the CIA investigated themselves and found nothing. It's like, well, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> so it's like, it's like, uh, the fat kid guarding the cookie jar and then saying, but I'm going to watch myself to make sure I don't eat them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Shea, where'd the, where'd the cookies go? I don't know. They just disappeared. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I was the fat kid. So I'm just, I'm, that's self, self, oh, okay. uh, self, uh, humor i guess <laughs> anyway that's uh kind of goes back to the no duh file and uh we'll continue on from there that doesn't surprise me at all and uh i think nobody expects anything different currently in today's another water is what article yeah yeah exactly it's kind of like really really that's going on i had no idea <laughs> stare at the camera blankly <laughs> All right, so let's continue to the next one. And uh, this is also coming from unexplained-mysteries.com. And this is ancient gold ring found in a shipwreck could depict Jesus. I did look over this just a little bit. I didn't read it, though. It says, revealed by Israel Antiquities Authority back in December, the ring shows a shepherd boy holding a sheep. Discovered at the site of two Roman-era shipwrecks found off the coast of Israel near the ancient port of Caesarea, uh, the exquisite octagonal gold ring uh, features an impressive blue-green gemstone sporting an image of some archaeologists now believe could be a depiction of Jesus himself. Known as the Good Shepherd Ring, it depicts the image of a young boy carrying a sheep or ram around his shoulders, which, according to the IAA, is one of the earliest and oldest images used in Christianity symbolizing Jesus. It represents Jesus as humanity's compassionate shepherd, extending his benevolence to his flock of believers and all mankind. But does the ring really depict Jesus? 
According to some experts, the Good Shepherd depiction of Jesus was itself adapted from earlier Greek and Roman art. The figure of a shepherd carrying a ram over his shoulders has an ancient pre-Christian precedent in the depiction of Hermes, the god's messenger and caretaking guide to the underworld, wrote art historian Robin Jensen. Comparisons have also been drawn between the shepherd and Orpheus, the tragic Lear-playing son of Apollo, so there is clearly room for interpretation over exactly who the ring depicts. As things stand, it's a debate that it is unlikely to be resolved any time soon. There is an image of the ring, and I think it's, it's really a, uh, a pretty huge ring. Uh, I'll put it in the TFR chat for those of you that are in there, and you can see what you think. That is a, that's a big ring. Wow, I see what you mean. <clears throat> hi, Gemini. Gemini says hi in the TFR chat. And... Uh, it is a big ring. That's a big, big, uh, big, I don't know. It looks, look at how yellow that gold is. We don't see that in the U.S. too often. No. Most, most of our gold is rather whitish, whitish yellow. Um, but this, that just means it's probably almost 24 karat gold or 22 karat. That's really wow. high quality. Um, anyway, very cool. It's a beautiful looking ring. Whatever it depicts, I'm sure it's a hell, heck of a treasure. Heck of a treasure, I tell you. There was a comment from earlier that I uh, <coughs> forgot to Excuse read. Uh -oh. uh, Android Purity says, Edward Snowden leaked the CIA spying on U.S. citizens is because law says you need a warrant to spy. Yeah. To spy on any U.S. citizen. But CIA doesn't need a warrant to spy on any non-U.S. citizen. Okay. Non-U.S., yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's like circumventing the U.S. citizen hurdle, I guess, is the thing. So All right. He's spying with a Okay, yeah, let's yeah. go to the next article here because there's more, ladies and gentlemen. There is more, but wait, there's more. And uh, this one comes from unexplained-mysteries.com. Israel farmer grows the world's heaviest strawberry. Is it paranormal? Maybe. It's a big strawberry. <laughs> so I thought it was newsworthy because who doesn't love a good <laughs> strawberry? Oh, my God, look at oh, that. that thing. Peyton's in chat. Hello, Peyton. Hey, Peyton. Good to see you, brother. Um <laughs> It says, Guinness Book of World Records has officially recognized the gargantuan berry as the heaviest ever recorded. Grown on the grounds of the Israeli uranium enrichment plant. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That's not what the article says. Um, okay. It says, we've seen quite a few examples of abnormally oversized fruit and vegetables over the years. And this enormous strawberry, which was grown by Israeli farmer Ch or Chahi or Kahi, Ariel is no exception. Weighing in at a ridiculous 289 grams, the strawberry is around five times heavier than the average weight of the, the Ilian strawberry or Ayan strawberry. The variety developed at Israel's Volcani Institute. Volcani Institute? Okay. Measuring 18 centimeters long and with a circumference of 34 centimeters, the strawberry was grown last year and had been kept frozen since then to give Guinness World Records a chance to authenticate it. Israel was, or uh, Aria was delighted when he heard that it had been <laughs> officially recognized as the world's heaviest. When we heard, it was an amazing feeling, he said. I jumped in the car, laughed, and sang. <laughs> this, guy, this guy needs some more entertainment. Um, <laughs> we, we've been waiting for this for a long time. <laughs> Oh, oh that's, I mean, that's kind of beautiful, right? Like, like his life goal was to have the biggest strawberry, and by God, he did it. Um, well, good for that you, is brother. Determination. I'll get that is. I'll, I respect it. Yep. I respect it. <laughs> if that was, you know, no matter what you do in life, if you love doing it, it's a good pursuit. And apparently, his was making big strawberries. The previous record holder was a Japanese farmer who grew a 250 gram strawberry back in 2015. Well, that record is now wiped. And there's a big one. I mean, uh, you know, is it? Is it gargantuan? No, it's not like a huge pumpkin or something, but it's about the size. You know, they're showing a picture of it for those of you on TFR or listening just auditorially. Um, there's a size, it's the size of an adult male's open palm and hand. So it's a pretty good sized berry. But question is, how did it taste? Yeah, well, here's the, here's the other question. Is it edible? Because let's say he pumped it full of chemicals to mutate <laughs> yes. the strawberries. You know, is it is it edible? Is this an edible strawberry? It's as edible as uranium. <laughs> I don't know whether it's edible or not. I'm sure it must be. It's just a really big berry. I don't know what you do to it to make them so big, though. Because that's, it's almost I'm like, saying. it's almost like, like a, a genetic anomaly, right? I mean, this is, 
this is not a healthy berry because obviously they don't grow that big. So <laughs> what's, what's going on with this one? And would you eat it? That's the other question. I um, would, but I wouldn't recommend anybody else. <laughs> You'd be willing to take one for the team? Good on you. Strawberries are my favorite fruit. Yeah. So I would, I would be willing. I okay. will, I will um, lay myself as tribute for everyone else. Don't worry. Okay. I'll make sure to save everyone. All right. Well, thanks for uh, <laughs> taking one for the team, buddy. Thank that's, you. That's some serious teamwork there. Um, all right. Well, there's a heavy strawberry. Never heard that anywhere else, I'll bet. Let's see what this is a good. If you come to the Paranormal Portal News, you get all kinds of news you didn't know you needed. That's right. Now you know. Now you know. <laughs> there's a brand new big strawberry, and you didn't know that before today. So you're welcome. Just saying. All right. Next article is from unexplained-mysteries.com. German university's camera system is designed to detect UFOs, which I think is really cool because, okay, so now, now there's actually universities getting involved in this uh, search for the UFOs. So I think that's cool. This is actually kind of exciting. It says the Skycam 5 camera system uses artificial intelligence to spot unidentified aerial phenomena. Perched high atop Julius Maximilian's Universität Würzburg JMU, <laughs> okay, could just said JMU building, in Bavaria, Germany, in a s unassuming gray box is the new eye of the sky for UFO researchers. The brainchild of Hakan Kayal, a professor of science and technology, the new camera system is the latest in a series of prototype models currently in operation on the university's roof. Mm hmm. It's mission to detect and analyze UFOs. Most of these observations concern, uh, observations concern known phenomena or objects such as birds, aircraft, satellites, or clouds, said Professor Kyle. But for a very small proportion, the, ca the cause remains unexplained, even after intensive investigation by experts. The SkyCam 5 camera works by continually watching the sky while using machine learning algorithms to automatically dismiss known phenomena, and other false detections. Over time, it will get smarter, enabling it to better detect a UFO if one does actually show up. Kyle himself admits that it is still early days. However, over time, he intends to secure additional funding so that more cameras can be set up to expand the system. Eventually, there could be a whole network of UFO detecting cameras set up all around the world, thus making it possible to not only detect these objects, but also to track them over long distances. It will be interesting to see how the project develops over the coming years. So it's kind of neat. I think that's, that could be exciting as far as absolutely unequivocally authenticating, you know, sightings. And right now, anybody with an iPhone can send stuff in and go, Hey, look, I saw a UFO. Well, maybe it's a UFO. Maybe it's not. Um, there's so many factors you have to weigh in. Could it be a drone? Could it be some normal aircraft? on just a, a, an unusual route that it doesn't normally take or any number of things. And so if these, these systems observe anomalies in the sky and, and categorically compare them against flight records of other, um, you know, possibly commercial aircraft and, and, you know, things that have been reported to whatever administration is used in Germany to report air traffic flight, then that's kind of cool. And plus versus known um, satellite routes and stuff. So, I don't know. That's kind of cool to me. What do you think, Sheldon? I think, I think it's really cool the fact that, um, you know, places in the world are um, taking these things more seriously and, like, universities are developing equipment specifically for it. I think it's uh, really cool to see, like, places take steps ahead right. and, you know, keep their mind open to these things. Absolutely. Absolutely. We advocate open minds here in the portal because right. without it, we'd be a bunch of idiots. <laughs> we might still be I idiots but, <laughs> but at least we're uh, believing idiots so all right let's continue on that was the news from germany's university camera system that's an exciting leap forward i think i agree for sure the next one up is coming from of course on explain-mysteries.com and this one is this one is weird <laughs> This is oh, no. not, well, it's kind of an odd one. Um, it says haunted doll, which weeps tears of acid rescued from house fire. Yikes. That's creepy. Oh. Uh, it says okay. a, a paranormal investigator has come into possession of a doll. He claims tries to set itself on fire. Ooh. 
this has got some personality disorders. <laughs> That's no. not good. Uh, creepy, ale- creepy allegedly haunted dolls have been the staple of paranormal movies for years, but there are some who believe that these unnerving objects can and do also exist in the real world. One 33-year-old investigator who goes by the name of Matt Paranormal. Nice. <laughs> really? nice. That's, That's awesome. <laughs> My name's Matt Paranormal. <laughs> He's got a, like an MP on his sweater. It's awesome. Recently acquired a doll that had been rescued from the charred remains of a building destroyed in a fire. The owners of the house had reportedly been killed in the blaze. Oh, that's tragic. After reading about her story with the house fire, I knew I wanted to buy her, said Matt. Since acquiring the doll, he has experienced a whole host of paranormal phenomena. After I had her imported to the UK, I had paranormal equipment installed into her as I thought her previous owner's spirits would be attached to her, he said. It wasn't until last year that Annie started actually to cry. I believe that when she cries, it is her attachment's way of showing emotions. Disturbingly, the alleged tears shed by the doll appear to be acidic. Not only that, but Matt also claims that the doll keeps trying to set itself on fire. Annie is now kept in a glass box and is under 24-hour surveillance because she keeps trying to set herself on fire. How How is she doing that? I'm just wondering, what's, what actions does a doll take when it's trying to burn itself? He said... Um, over, overheating the, the yeah, equipment, I guess. Rubbing its little <laughs> fingers together like, you know, starting a fire sticks. <laughs> I hate you guys. I hate you. Um, I don't know. Uh, oh, wait. It's not like oh, they got a, point. You know, a lighter in their pocket or something. Uh, but anyway, every now and then her clothes get a little bit more singed and charred, and her face is much darker now. Annie loves fire, and last year, each of my five team members all had something to do with fire happen to their house, all on the same day. Well, that is creepy. Um, I don't know. You guys will have to let me know in the comments. Do you believe uh, dolls can exhibit this kind of haunting and intelligence or have a spirit attached to them, perhaps, that would try to cause havoc and, and mayhem like that? And maybe, maybe they do. I'm, I'm not... Trying to be real cheeky about it, I don't don't pretend to know. I know the claims are out there, but um, could it actually try to set fire to itself? Is that something that makes sense? And let me know. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on that. Yeah, seriously. Mm-hmm. Totally it's, seriously. I um, mean, uh, you know, you mean what? Who's who's gonna watch this doll for twenty four hours? That's like a over full time job right there. Payne I, I, brought, I brought that up. <laughs> I think they probably use cameras. I don't think. I don't think they. Got, I know, but they got, then you they, have to. It's like you have it recorded, like let's say overnight. But that means someone has to go through the footage sure. of that night to see if there's any phenomena. It's probably motion activated though. So like uh, you know, there's oh. triggers you can set on a camera. Like if if oh, yeah, the yeah. frame changes a certain percentage, boom, start recording. And so it constantly compares the pixels on the sensor. And once some change happens, boom, it'll start recording and, you know, try to capture, capture that. So it's, it's just motion activated, uh, trigger, I'm sure. But so, I mean, yeah, sitting around <laughs> watching, watching 12 hours of, of doll <laughs> sitting in a cage. I think that might be a quick road to like mental illness. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> and so the cameras are activated by fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're heat activated cameras. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Could be. That might do it. But anyway, that's a possibility. Um, yeah. You know what? You know what, Sheldon? That What's is that? actually the last article I got tonight. Um, let's gosh. see how we're doing, which is absolutely perfect because we're at about a minute from the break. So actually oh, a minute yeah. and a half. How about that? How about that? So we did good. We actually did it all uh, right on schedule and got through the news. So, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a production of the Paranormal Portal News. Back to your regularly scheduled program. Well, how do you like that? There we go. We are back at it. 
It is uh, now almost the first break, ladies and gentlemen. If you're new to the show, um, these are network nights. Friday and Saturday nights are network nights, meaning the Paranormal Portal is not only broadcasting on YouTube, but we are also broadcasting on TFR Live, iHeart, TuneIn, and TalkStream Live. And as such, as we're part of those other networks, they take breaks every half hour, and so we have to adhere to that. So those of you on YouTube will be... um, greeted with some music and videos that I compiled for your viewing pleasure while the break happens. Otherwise I could just let you listen to commercials, but no, <laughs> no, they, they didn't pay me anything for that. So, <laughs> yeah. So we're not going to go that route, but anyway, yeah, no, it's uh it's fantastic. And uh, then we'll come back. We got a lot of stuff to get through tonight, including some more trucker stories over the road truckers with creepy experiences and a bunch of creature reports from phantoms and monsters tonight and whatever else we can dig into in the time we got. There's the bell. We'll be right back.
right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We are into the second half hour of tonight's show. It's cruising by, but I think it's going well. What do you think, Sheldon? I think it's going fantastic. Fantastic. I like your exuberance. Uh, Rachel gets it right, says, if that doll is trying to catch fire, could a djinn be b- b- bound to it as the doll is a talisman? They are the spirits of fire, I think. Well, the djinn were forged of the blue flame. I don't know if that makes them a fire spirit necessarily. I suppose it does, but um, I'm not so sure that that it is quite as elemental as like a fire elemental or earth elemental or things like that are supposed to be. But it is an interesting uh, correlation. Now, I, I will say that as far as I know, the original purpose for dolls in some schools of thought was that they were never meant to be child play things. They were supposed to be vessels for the dead. And so uh, it's one of the reasons. Really? Yeah. Like they were never meant to be child's toys. And Wait, uh, one of what? the reasons the Amish won't put faces on their dolls, they won't allow it is because they believe if there's the face on the doll, it becomes an attractive home for a, an evil spirit. So <clears throat> there is uh, several schools of thought that say dolls are p- potential repositories or containers for evil spirits. So, um, you know, I don't know, take it or leave it, but <laughs> it's, you know, it probably the ancient people would be rolling their eyes going, you give your kid what? That's <laughs> <laughs> true. <Sure>. What? <laughs> no, 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 no. You got this wrong. Um, but it is what it is. I don't know. Those are just some ideas. I, I guess it's a great thought. I mean, it's certainly possible that it could be something bound to it. I think that there are some uh, dark esoteric practices that that bind spirits to dolls, and that's, of course, another uh, possibility that could it have been something that was bound um, against its will, you know, in, a, in some form of dark practice, and maybe... It's, it's anybody's guess. I do believe in haunted dolls. Don't get me wrong. I don't mean to cast questions about whether there could be such a thing or if there are dolls that are inhabited by evil spirits. I think those are certainly possible, and I think that uh, you know there's, there's certainly precedent for it in the paranormal, but um, I guess it's anybody's guess. So just some food for thought. Yeah. Yeah, mirrors too. Daryl says mirror, mirrors, are, and mirrors are... are uh, well, I mean, they're they're considered gateways by many different practices that they can be gateways or are at least a mystical object. And, uh, you know, now, you know, there's mirrors in like your car visor. You whip it down and make sure your, your hair looks good. But <laughs> they were largely used for in ancient times for scrying and other things such as that. But anyway, they, I mean, they were used for self-reflection too, but... Uh, anyway, um, I guess we're just spider webbing all over the place, which is fine, but I want to love spider webs. I know you do. You, you, uh, <laughs> you love when the conversation just goes askew and that's fine. I don't mind discussing anything you guys want to. That's cool. That's part of the beauty of the show. We're not bound to any, uh, any, uh, any schedule or any criteria. We can talk about whatever we want to. It's Wait, just, so I can bring up anything. You always do. What do you mean, Ken? <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's do it. So um, I had a question. Um, Peyton uh, told me about the uh, vanishing of Flight 370, I think it was. Have you heard anything about that? Is that the, the one out of Malaysia? I don't know. There's, I mean, there's, there's more than one vanishing flight, but um, there was several vanishing flights that occurred around the Bermuda Triangle. There's the, there's the one out of Malaysia. And I don't know. I, I think it's the one out of Malaysia that he's talking about. And I don't know much uh, about it at all. I know there's lots of ideas, including that it was possibly rerouted because there were certain passengers on there that uh, um, needed to be taken in or, or taken out of circulation for whatever reason. And uh, I've heard all of that different intrigue. I don't know what to make of any of it because I just couldn't know. Um, if it did crash into the ocean, it was way off a of schedule but, or way off course because they did go over the flight path and found no wreckage, which doesn't seem likely. So for whatever reason, it just not only did it disappear from radar, but it may have, uh, may have been routed off of radar by uh, some other forces, meaning some covert forces, or it could have been that the pilot was just not good at his job and crashed. I don't know. It's, it's, it's anybody's guess. I don't know. 
those those things are tough because I just I don't know what's going on in the world. I here's the thing. I I know that there's lots of there's lots of there's lots of potential dark things going on. But I really try not to think about them too much and maybe that's my own personal bias, but it's like if you start thinking about how broken everything is, suddenly it just feels like every day gets heavy and I I just all I know is I can control my my life and my circumstances to the best of my ability. And everything outside of that, I don't know. I don't know what to do with it. So I try not to focus too much on those big, big things because I just don't know. I don't Does that make any sense, Peyton Pop? I sent Sheldon a link, link to a deep dive into it, and it's pretty interesting once you know all the facts. Yeah, I mean, I, it's not – I would be – perfectly willing to look into it i just don't know much about it out, outside of what i just shared um but i do know that there were some p alleged photos that were taken from some strange base that allegedly came from some of the passengers of that plane some island uh airstrip that was set up that wasn't on the records or maps that allegedly people were you know, like landing there and taking pictures, like, why are we here? Where is this? What's going on? And then suddenly nothing else. So if this is the same thing, I don't know. It's pretty, pretty creepy. Possibly, possibly. Um, let's continue on. We're going to get into these trucker stories that are pretty fascinating. We've gone through several of them from this article that we covered. We started covering it last night when Don and I were here. And uh, now we're going to get back into it. And this is from roughmaps.com. Uh, it's the trucker's creepiest experiences. And it's not, I don't think it's a, it's a, a it's one of those odd articles that this site isn't necessarily known for paranormal, but they aggregated this list. Maybe they did it around Halloween a lot of times when pretty much everybody decides to get paranormal, you know, because it's, it's cool around Halloween. So maybe that's why this was compiled way back when, but we're on number 17 right now. And again, we, I've, as having the paranormal portal, I've talked to several people that are over the road truckers. One of them is our good friend, Mr. MCAT, who is one of our mods here. And yep. he's called in and shared some of his weird stories. I mean, over the road truckers see some weird stuff because they are in all niches and corners of the, of the globe at some of the weirdest times of day when there's not another car around. Well, sometimes when it's real dark and still things go sideways quite a bit. So these, guys Oh yeah, these, these trucker stories are some of the best. Um, I remember it was, I think it was months ago. It was the last time um, we went through like trucker stories, but they, they're great because they like like Dad said like they they go everywhere and they see all the things that normal people don't see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yep. there's a lot of miles that they cover, and they and they, again, it'll you know if they, it'll, it's my firm belief. Speaking of the roads, and it's something that has came up on an interview that I did with uh, Charles Howard Johnson. Uh, he's an investigator. He's he's uh, going to appear on the podcast tomorrow night as well, but. Um, he and I were talking and, and I think probably the next Patterson Gimlin film is going to come from a dash cam. I'm pretty convinced because of all of the Bigfoot sightings there are along roadways, people, there's so many stories of people having these huge creatures just crossing the road nonchalantly in front of them. Sometimes they're running across the road. Sometimes they're jumping, but every once in a while, there's just some just lumbered along. And I'm thinking <laughs> that's probably going to be where the next Patterson Gimlin film comes from. It's somebody's dash cam. They're going to be like, oh, my God, you guys aren't going to see this. And I caught it. I got it. And uh, it's going to be incredible. I'm just waiting for it to happen. All right. Awesome. No number 17 on this list of creepiest trucker stories. I was driving a flatbed and picked up a load of construction material. I strapped everything down, put a tarp over the load, and left. After five miles down the road, in the middle of nowhere, I noticed my tarp flapping in the wind. I found a wide shoulder and pulled over to fix it. I realized that I did a bad job tarping this load the first time and decided to redo it on the side of the road. Well, I undid all the bungee straps, dragged the tarps off, rolled them back up, climb up onto the load and start unrolling the tarps again. And that's when I see a guy walking down the same side of the road I'm on coming towards my truck. I don't think anything about it other than to keep an eye on him because I'm in the middle of nowhere and continue doing what I'm doing. About the time I have the tarp set in place and climbing down to start hooking the bungee straps back on, 
this dude is getting close enough now that I'm paying more attention to him than I am tarping my load. I grab my winch bar and set it on the trailer where I'm working just in case. The guy gets to me, and the first thing I notice is his hair. It's like a mullet. Yeah, that'll scare you. But it's, <laughs> but it's patchy. Like he tried to cut it on his own hair and had seizures in the process. The next thing I noticed were his eyes, which I can only describe as off. Like they were clear. And he seemed sober, but they also gave me the distinct impression that the elevator didn't go all the way up to the top. His clothes were dirty and not well maintained with dirty white tennis shoes. I remember he didn't have laces on one shoe and the tongue was noticeably out of place. He stops by me, waits till I acknowledge him. His words made me shiver. He says, I've got a long walk. And I'm like, yeah, man, you do. We're in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I love it. This guy's like, nope, you're not getting in. Making it clear there's no ride to be had here. He nods, starts walking by me, continuing on his way. Then he stops at about the driver door in my truck and turns around, comes back to me and repeats himself. I've got a long walk. At this point, I explained explicitly that I can't give him a ride, insurance and all of that. I apologize for not being able to help him out, and he seems to accept this, turns around and leaves. I wait for him to get a little ways away from the truck and start working on finishing my tarp job. I still keep an eye on him, and he's moving away from me. As I'm putting on the last, the last of the bungee straps, I look over to check where he's at, and he's turned around heading back towards me now about 100 yards in front of my truck and coming back my way. It look, looks like he's talking on a cell phone. He has his hand up to his face, but I can barely make out his mouth moving. Meanwhile, his other hand is waving like he's having a conversation with someone. I finish with the straps, grab my winch bar, and I'm up on climbing up into my truck, and he's about 10 yards away now. Soon as I'm in the cab, I lock the doors and set the winch bar on the passenger seat just in case. I look at the guy and realize he's not talking on a phone. He's just talking to his hand. <laughs> oh my God. Now I'm really nervous because he doesn't look like he's having a nice chat. Nice chat. It looks more like an angry conversation. I crank the truck up, put it in gear, and just pull out. Didn't look for traffic or anything. As I pass him, he's just looking at me, still holding his hand to his face, and just staring at me. It gave me the creeps. About the time I hit fifth or sixth gear, I look in the mirror, and there's no one there. Oof. That oh, is really no, creepy. No. That's, yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's by Pen Bandit. Well, that's all kinds I, of wrong. I mean, really, I mean, I guess that could have been someone that was really high on something, but uh, <laughs> everything else screams like skinwalkery type of yeah. offness to it. Yeah, that screams like like almost zombie face eater kind of thing. Yeah, whatever's going yeah. on. Nothing good would have come out of that. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, I told him I agreed. You got a long walk. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that was funny. Yes, you do. <laughs> yeah, boy, it wouldn't want to be you. Sucks. <laughs> oh, man, that's hilarious. The guy's like, nope, you're not getting in my truck. I agree uh, with his decision. <laughs> I do too. I, there's no way, you know, and, and I try to help out everyone I can, whenever I can, but that's one of those situations that's nope. I put five in the dirt for you, but other than that, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's about right. All right. Number 18, things that go bump in the night. I was parked at a dirt turnout in the Arizona desert for the night. Speaking of uh, skinwalkers, this is out in Navajo country at about 2 a.m. I woke up to scratching at the window of my sleeper, and it went on for about 15 minutes. I'm sitting there in the dark, scared to bones, and I'm wondering what the heck is happening with my my a knife in my hand with with my a knife in my hand. Okay. After it ended, I waited another 15 minutes or so before I opened my curtain and looked out the windows. I couldn't see anything outside, and I was still the only one parked there. Got out the next morning. And all I found were some footprints coming up to the truck and eventually walking back out into the desert. Haven't parked there since. I always stop at a small truck stop nearby now. Yeah, no doubt. That is yeah. Skinwalker Range right there, the Navajo Range. Oof. There's all kinds of stories of skinwalkers out there, especially coming out of the desert. I mean, that's just not normal. 
but that was by Rebel Actual. All as right. far as Skinwalker uh, lore and all mm-hmm. that, yeah. I, um, what do they? Uh, as far as the lore goes, what do they usually consume? I don't know. I mean, actually, I don't know, and I, I've never heard much discussion about what they eat. There's, you know, there's plenty of of stories of them taking over people, draining the life out of people, um, kind of zombifying them and drawing their life force. But I don't know. I mean, I don't know if they're, if they just, you know, make sandwiches like everyone else or, <laughs> or do they chew on roadkill or what? I don't know. I mean, and I, I don't mean to be cheeky. I just don't know because that part of the story never really comes up. It's almost like nobody sees them eating stuff. It's just, yeah. they, they just see them. And they know that they are supernatural just because of the, you know, the heebie-jeebies and all of that. But I don't know. I can't recall a story where somebody's seen them eating. But maybe. Maybe there isn't. Maybe I've missed it. But it's hard, you know, in the, in the idea when you think about it. I've covered thousands, literally thousands of stories since starting the show. And it's amazing I remember as much as I do because, you know, at some point it's just like, well, is that something I just thought of or is that really something I read? <laughs> You get to that point where it all just this bucket of, of words, but Pey- Peyton's guess was skin. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what they walk on Peyton. <laughs> Android says, uh, I believe they are depicted by the natives as more of a spiritual being or else. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, they've been, they've been depicted in many ways. Uh, of course there is the, the supernatural. That means skinwalkers basically a shapeshifter by, you know, by definition, and, and the the idea is they'll kill like stray dogs or stray coyotes or whatever, and they'll grab the skin and wrap themselves in it, and then basically become that. So they yeah. they they imbue the the ability of that to themselves. Um, but you know, again, it's not not ever so much about them eating, but they do seem to be physical uh, by most reports I, you know that i've that i've heard i mean they leave physical scratches on things they you know people hear them banging now spirits bang too and stuff like that but um it does seem that they are physical at least in in some regard could they be something else but they're usually regarded as like dark shaman shaman you know these these dark shamanistic figures that have reached the supernatural ability due to dark practices so um at least legendarily speaking, that's how they seem to be defined. So I, I always assume they're a physical creature, but they may have access to otherworldly, uh, you know, not only ability, but, uh, you know, possibility. Like maybe they can step in and out of our reality. I don't know. Very strange. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough to find a lot of information on skinwalkers because they're, the First Nations, and especially the Navajo, they don't talk about them. Because yeah. in their culture, to talk about them is essentially summoning them, you know, to you. And nobody wants to cross that. Nobody wants to, because you have to understand that in many practices, the, ability, the, the, the idea of speaking something is to create it. And um, because, in, and if you think about it, I mean, it starts out as a thought, which is a completely energetic thing. And then you're vibrating it into our physical reality with sound. And so that has a profound power to it. It's not just, you know, the ability to make sound waves and to make noise. You're, you're, you, you are impressing something from the non-physical into the physical. And so it's a very profound act. Words are a very profound spiritual act. And so they won't talk about it because they don't want to vibrate that into reality. They don't want to create that into their, into their realm of experience. So I don't know if that isn't, makes sense. Isn't that the point of speak no evil? Well, sure. I mean, yeah, because of course, whatever you speak into, you create an energy and a resonance and, you know, and a magnetism as well. So <clears throat> those are all pretty esoteric ideas, whether you subscribe to that or not. But I think, I think it's important to look at the, the, the old wisdoms because there is a wisdom to them. They're not just empty, foolhardy uh, folklores. There's a reason right. they came to these conclusions, and I don't, you know, I, it's, I just don't, my, my thing is you don't ever challenge the universe, because eventually the universe is going to answer. <laughs> so, I don't want to do uh, that. Cold Stairs says, I have talked with, uh, I'm sorry if I butcher this, Goshut, uh, Ute, and Navajo members, and they all believe in skinwalkers. Mm-hmm. When they do talk, it is very limited. 
Yeah, yeah, they just don't want to share it. And and so probably culturally they have a lot of stories, but it's just very very carefully guarded. They don't they don't talk it because they don't want to create it. Um number 19, the Phantom Touch. I was driving out of Eastern Washington on some state roads and there were no rest stops or cities, but I'd done the route enough to know there were, there were these massive dirt areas every 40 miles where you could park safely away from the road. I decided to call it a night and close my blinds and lay down to watch something on my phone. After roughly an hour, I hear someone try to open the driver's side door. Well, I hadn't heard any vehicles on the road the whole time. I'm parked, but I get up to peek out of the curtains, and as I'm looking out into the blackness of the window, I hear them try the passenger side door. I peek down from the top of the curtain but can't see anything, so I start the truck and kick on the lights. I'm fairly freaked out at this point, so I'm not opening the curtains but peeking through gaps. Nothing. Nobody is standing near either of my doors or parked within sight line. I take a deep breath and close the sleeper curtains too because for some reason that's going to make things better, right? But the worst was yet to come. After laying back down and convincing myself that something blew against the truck and it only sounded like the doors, I hear what sounds like someone trying to pry open the vents on the sleeper. The door handles start clicking again and the truck starts shifting like someone's climbing on it. I hit the little alarm button on the sleeper, hoping to spook them off. It does nothing but add to the noise of the handles and the fingers tapping on windows and chassis and the hiss of air coming out of the suspension. Then suddenly... It stops. A few minutes where, where I can only hear myself breathing and my heart pounding before I hear another truck approach and then drive by. I spent the next few hours waiting for whatever it was to come back, but it never did. In the morning, I couldn't find any footprints or damage to my truck, but on every window, there were tiny human-looking handprints, like a toddler had licked their hand and stuck it to my window over and over. Oof. Oof. It says no, no, no. What? No, that's just that's just freaky. Like no, I I don't ever no, yeah. just no. Mm -hmm. Well, that you know that actually sounds like some some kind of little people thing. Like uh, you know, was it a the gnome puckwudgie? Um, any number of the different diminutive creatures that allegedly roam our lands. Um, could it be them? Maybe. Jeez. It it reminds me of um a. Uh, um, what is it? The Blair Witch Project? See, I never saw Anything? that. I didn't want to watch. Oh. I didn't want to watch a bunch of shaky camera landscape. <laughs> Davis is very upset with you right now. I'm sure he is. He'll have to get over it because I don't know. It, <laughs> I it looked. I looked at it. It looked like you give me a headache, and I was like, No, I, I'm okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. Yeah. I mean, it's anybody's guess. But uh, number twenty, the hills have eyes. We're down to just oh, a couple. Of, sorry, I missed it. I missed a comment. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Rachel gets right. Says skinwalkers. If they are summoned by talking about them, they're probably something with great dedication to what they are. If that's a protector or a force of indiscriminate harm. Well, it's the same is true. Uh, there's a belief in, in demonology, the same, the same regard that you should never speak the name of a demon. It's the, because it is believed that by speaking the name of a demon, it's actual name, you are summoning it to you. And it's the same philosophy. So I guess it's, 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 it's hold that whole esoteric idea of, of, of speaking that's, uh, you know, which is funny. I find that funny about the demons, uh, because if that's the case, it's funny that by naming the demon, you can call it to you. But in the Catholic rite of exorcism, one of the key things that you try to do is get the demon to surrender its name because by doing so, it surrenders its power, or at least a part of its power, and makes the exorcism so much more likely to be effective. And, and I find that funny. It's something about the name. If it hears it, it can come to you. But if it says it, it's diminished by that. It's very curious. I don't know. I don't know what to think about it. But you know what I do think? Sheldon's muted. He's trying to talk. <laughs> oh, I said, yeah, it's break time. <laughs> it's break time. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh, it's okay. You'll get, you'll get used to all these buttons pretty quick. Um, right. We're going to go to our hour break here, ladies and gentlemen. So don't go away and we'll get back to more of these strange 
strange stories from truckers. These are pretty cool, I got to admit. And then we're going to get into some, uh, probably in the last hour, we're going to, or last half hour, we'll get into some reports from phantoms and monsters from Lon Strickler talking about some weird creatures there. So we got a lot of creature feature tonight here on the portal. And uh, we've got a lot more to go. So hour number two is just around the corner. So don't go away. Don't forget to hit that like if you're already here. And if you're not subscribed, please get subscribed. We are um, nearing, very near the 10,000 subscriber mark, which is a huge benchmark for me. So please subscribe if you're not already. And we'll be back in just a couple minutes with more of the portal. Caroline is not 
like those she's with. They're attracted to the one thing about her that is different from themselves. Her life force it is very strong. It gives off its own illumination. It is a light that complies life and memory of love and home and earthly pleasures. Something they desperately desire, but can't have anymore. Right now, she's the closest thing to that. Poltergeist are usually associated with an individual. Hauntings seem to be connected with an area. A house, usually. Your guys' disturbances of fairly short duration, perhaps a couple of months. Hauntings can go on for years. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are now embarking on hour number two. Wow. One hour came and went like that. Boom. It's done. But we're into hour number two now, and everything is possible, including a phone call. we got a phone call on the deck here, so let's see. Right. I know who's calling, but let's see who's calling, even though I know who it is. All right. Area code 407, you're on the air. Hello, is this the con? Oh, did I, did I unmute it? Did I mute it? What the hell did I do? Uh, what the hell? Hold on. I don't know. I got it. Uh -oh. oh, there it is. Uh -oh. Okay. <laughs> Area code 40417. You're on the air. Really? Now you're really on the air. <laughs> for, for real, I'm on the air. <laughs> All right. Last time I was just jerking your chain, but now you're really hey. on the air. <laughs> That's kind okay. of what this, so, you know. Yeah, I'm new to all yeah. this button stuff, so. <laughs> I think we I think we got a major delay too. Uh, oh. I was talking about a car I had one time that was haunted. This oh. is Ruger, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, Ruger? I should have said. And that. Yeah. okay, okay. Uh, I had a, I come home from the service. I come home from the service, and I was needing an automobile, and I found a really nice '63 and a half. Ford Galaxy, Ooh. bright red, oh. uh, just fell in love with. So I buy this old car, and when I buy it, I bought it off a guy, and he just wanted rid of it, you know. And he <laughs> was at a, it was at a classic car place, but he just had it pushed out front on sale, you know, got to go. Uh -huh. So I got looking at it, and the, the old motor, a different motor, had been put in it, and it wasn't put in very good. And the interior was shot. So anyway, I buy this car and I start fixing it up and uh, put all new interior in it and just spent a ton of money on this car, lived, eat, and breathed this car. Okay. And the more money I spent, the le the more I wasted. It was like two step forwards, one step back. Oh. You know, this car fought me all the way. Ooh. So anyway, I get it, I get it going and uh, I went through like four transmissions. Oh, wow. uh, I had a had a flywheel come loose and try to come up through the floor. Oh my god! Uh, I mean, it was just. I mean, of course, I rotted it, man. I just. I mean, it was <laughs> on the wood all the time. But I mean, just we had weird shit happen to him, you know. Wow. But anyway, I get this car all lined out, and I'm driving it every day, and we're expecting a new baby, and uh, so. I have my daughter, and I tell my wife, I'm going home, I'm going to put seatbelts in the Galaxy, and we're going to bring daughter home from the hospital in the Galaxy. Okay. And she's like, okay, okay, cool. So I did. So get to the hospital and everything. They said, okay, we're going to wheel her out this door here. And I said, okay, fine. So I go grab the Ford, and I bring it around the side door, and there's a couple women out there smoking oh. off this side door. This was back in the 80s, by the way. Sure. Anyway, I pull up. And this gal just gets white as a ghost, and I get out of the car all excited, you know. I'm going to pick up my daughter and my wife and everything. And she said, where did you get that car? <laughs> and so I told her, and she said, oh, you don't know about that car. 
And I said, lady, I know everything about this car. <laughs> and she said, no, you don't. And I said, well, I've got to go get my kid. Wheeled my wife out, and this old gal just about has a fit. Are you taking that new baby home in that car? And I said, yeah. You know, I'm getting a little perturbed. Yeah, I'm taking my daughter over this car. But it wasn't all my car. So I get the daughter and the wife loaded up, and she starts telling me the story. This car was responsible for two suicides, Ooh. two or three, two or three major addictions. One of them led to suicide. Oh, no. It ended up ruining three different marriages. This car came from Texas, and a guy had offed himself in it oh, in no. the garage, and that's why it didn't have any interior. Oh, the sister. How was this? Now the sister of the first guy who offed himself in it, her husband worked for a car moving company up here in Missouri. Uh -huh. She got the car and they moved it up here. Her husband got all strung out fixing the car up and that ended that marriage and put him like in the bug hut for lack of better terms. <laughs> so she hut. sells it to the guy that I bought it off of. Okay. Well, when it was all said and done, two suicides, like three addictions, I sell it to a guy after I rolled the car. Yo, here's a story. Me and a guy was out partying one night, and I come around the corner, and I laid this old Galaxy up on the driver's side door handle. Oh, my God. So now we are right, we are right on the verge of rolling it over on the top. And I tell him, I said, we got to get out of this thing in case it catches fire. Uh -huh. And so we're out the passenger door window because we're almost on our top. Right. We get outside. We get outside. I tuck out a no lady's mailbox. It was a big ordeal. The cops showed up. They called a wrecker and all this. No tickets for driving under the influence. Wow. But we're waiting on the wrecker to show up. And the wrecker backs up to the front of the car. And right in front of this car, which is laying on the driver's side door handle, is a stack of of cassette tapes just like you had picked them up out of the car and set them down in the ground right in front of them. Somehow that whole stack of cassette tapes came out of that car that we could not hardly get out of ourselves and just laid themselves in front of the front bumper. Oh, that's creepy. And I never, never, yeah, never have figured that out. But anyway, I sold it to another guy. He had worse luck with it than I did. <laughs> so I don't know where the car is now. Oh Last I heard it was sitting in a barn somewhere that oh. the old boy who ended up with it was afraid to drive it. But <laughs> I don't know. But that's, <laughs> that's the, that's the longest short story of my haunted 63 wow. galaxy. I got that's pretty crazy. You had your own Christine then, huh? I, I did. And it was bright red. And at night it looked like it. Wow. That's it looked like so it. Oh, creepy. Yeah. Yeah, they were built like tanks. I had a friend. I had a friend, and him and his wife, and me and my wife used to cruise around in it. And every time she got in the car, the old car would quit. <laughs> if we put her, out, if we put her out on the sidewalk, we could run all over town. But as soon as she got in the car, we'd get like a hundred feet, and something would break. <laughs> she didn't you know? like her. Yeah, she was. No, he didn't like her. No. Martha yeah. did not like her. <laughs> so. All right, man. I'll let you guys get back with the show. Well, thank you, brother. I appreciate the story and I appreciate you, you calling in. Great to hear from you. <laughs> Take care, Ruger. Later. All right. See ya. That's really cool. Wow. Wow. That's some spooky stuff. I don't know. You know, there again, it, it doesn't have to be a doll. It can be a thing, and uh, hard to know. I mean, what what happens that? Because I, <laughs> he talked about it eating transmissions, and I was thinking about my old Trans Am. I had a Trans Am. It was an 81 Trans Am, black, beautiful car, T-tops, the whole works. And I loved that car. And throughout the time I had it, it, it went through three transmissions. It's like you couldn't keep that thing with, with a working transmission. Now, it might have been something conducive to that year of, of Trans Am. It was the last year of the Bandit Edition, but it was a pretty car. Oh, I, it was a heartbreaker to have to give it up, but this is before you. 
And so oh. it was a great car. It was the Smokey and the Bandit car, really. It was just awesome. Oh. Love that car, but man, it just chewed up transmissions like crazy. And I always thought, what the hell is wrong with this car? I had them transmissions rebuilt. I tried new transmission. I, I don't know. It just didn't want to work. Maybe it was me. <laughs> Maybe it didn't like me. Could be. All I remember is that your green car was lasted um, in immensely long time. <laughs> yeah, she's the old green Taurus, man. That thing went forever. Oh, and it, uh, it was just basically a set of tires with uh, a lot of duct tape and bailing wire and good intentions. It was just, oh, the frame was so rusted. It was just... <laughs> By um, the end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a good car, though. That thing kept going for as long as, you know, I mean, until we finally just got rid of it. Because it, oh, was, yeah, it yeah. was a death trap, but... <laughs> But yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty wild. That's cool. I, you know, of course the story of Christine, if you've read Stephen King or seen the movie, um, that's a haunted car and, and you know, is this a real life example of it? It wouldn't surprise me even a little. I believe exactly that happened. He said, as he said, it happened. And I'll tell you, there's houses that seem to destroy people. There are items that seem to destroy people. And are they, are they quote unquote cursed or is there just a black cloud hanging over them, just making, you know, spreading doom wherever they go? Or are they, you know, is this just the luck of the draw that some some items just end up wrong um, right off the... So, like, the, the, the idea is that, you know, everything's mass-produced. There's assembly lines churning out cars and cars and cars. Is it possible that every once in a while you get the jinxed car, the, the lemon that everybody talks about. It's a lemon. It's a lemon. This car was always a lemon. Now the rest of the cars came out of that same place. will be absolutely brilliant, but there's that one car and why nobody knows. I don't know. Is it just part of uh, the law of averages? Once in a while, you're just going to get a turd. Nothing you can do about it. I don't know. I thought of a, I thought of a <clears throat> question actually. Okay. Um, different, uh, different kind of question. I'm figure out how to word it, but let me see if you can kind of figure out what I'm trying to ask at least. But, okay. um, is it, um, do you think it's possible that, um, a spirit or a dark entity of some sort can latch itself onto a person like it does an object? Absolutely. Type of thing? It's called an attachment and, uh, attachments are, are one thing that, you know, people can just walk around with a dark cloud over their head and it's not necessarily a possession, but it's just being surrounded yeah. by this aura of darkness that something has attached themselves to you. And yeah, there's lots of spiritual attachment, attachment stories. <clears throat> and uh they are they are uh you know weird stories uh but it's it, you've got to almost treat it like a small exorcism though you got to clean that off and it's not nearly as in depth as an exorcism an actual exorcism but it's you know there are just dark things that leech off of us and maybe they feed on happiness maybe they feed on our good energies and just give us the bad or maybe they create bad energies cuz that's what they feed on i don't know but what I'm, um, it, what I mean is like, um, where they, they don't do anything to the subject it's attached to, but to everything else around it yeah. type of thing. <clears throat> sure. I mean, that's, it's a different kind of attachment, but it's, it's certainly, uh, plausible. I, you know, again, you know, there's no way to say yes, this happens or no, this doesn't happen well, yeah. with any of this. That's true. It's all unquantifiable, but yeah, I believe it is. I believe that yeah. that's very possible. There are, there, there could be, you know, some jealous spirit attached to somebody that he wants to push everyone around them away, but it doesn't make their life hell. It makes everyone else's life hell. So that's certainly possible too. And, and in fact, I would say that that's kind of the start of a spiritual uh, oppression, oppression, um, because it, you know, a lot of times possession doesn't just happen. It's not like a spirit just goes, I mean, it can, there are certainly, um, instances where boom, somebody's just instantly possessed. And then, you know, generally those aren't long lasting They're You know, you, you see videos depicting it. I can't say that they're accurate or real, but depicting somebody being just taken over and, you know, it lasts maybe a few minutes and then boom, they kick something out. And, uh, in fact, that last break had a couple of videos that portend to, or oh, yeah. to portray that and whether they're act actual or not, I, you know, I don't know, but the oppression is the first stage. First is attachment, then oppression. And oppression is basically wearing the person down. And it's that feeling of dragging around a dark cloud and putting a person in a constant state of depression to weaken their aura. 
And then after the oppression comes the possession. And the possession progresses until it reaches a state called perfect possession. And perfect possession is the actual final state of, of possession in that there is no differentiating between the possessing spirit and the person anymore. It's a perfect melding and where the spirit is completely taken over. So, and by that time, there, you know, it's probably nothing can be done to help the people. So that's the concept. I wonder if that's, yeah, for people that like, you, you know, those, they're those people that just hate the world. They hate everyone. They, they're just angry. They're, they're, they don't ever seem to be happy yeah. type of thing, but on an aggressive level, not just, you know, not sure. like a kind of a broken past type of thing. I wonder if that's why, or what? that's how that <clears throat> Oh, I think in a lot of cases, though, to be honest with you, I think blaming a spirit for that kind of stuff is is easy. But I, I think that people are very potent uh, manifestors of their reality, and people don't realize they have that ability. So it's like, God, why does everything bad always happen to me? This sucks. Oh, everything I do sucks. And and it's because when you generate and live in that kind of energy and frustration, you're radiating that into your experience. And as you're radiating that into your experience, you're creating those circumstances in your life. I think it can be great. Like some people seem to be just charmed. Everything they do is just wonderful and they always land on their feet and that's the same concept. They're radiating, radiating a severe positivity in their life and therefore the, the, the circumstances of their experiences are echoing that. I believe uh, ultimately that what you put out is what comes back. It's a magnetism or you know, a concept of magnetism that you magnetize yourself for things. So if you magnetize yourself for good things, then you will draw those things into you. And if you magnetize yourself for bad things just by believing that you're a victim and everybody always beats up on you and nobody likes you, then that's what you radiate and that will be your experience. So whether or not I'm right, I don't know. It's just my own personal philosophy. Take it or leave yeah. it, but yeah. Uh, Brooks asks, uh, did you see, quote, really haunted on YouTube last video? That was crazy. No, I didn't. I, I wish I had more time for that, but I, I, lo I love watching paranormal videos on YouTube and paranormal videos on TV and stuff, but I, I just don't have enough time to do it. But yeah. Yeah. Northern orb. How you doing? That's a new name. How you doing? Good to see you. Any tips to avoid spirit attachment? Sure. Um, you've have a, have a, uh, I mean, depends on your religion, depends on your faith, what you believe. But if you are Christian invoke the invoke God, invoke uh, Jesus or whatever, to protect you, call the angels, call your ancestors, go call, call the divine light, call the universe, the universal light. Uh, prayer is incredibly powerful. Um, and, and if not, then radiate positivity, uh, cleanse yourself by smudging native American practice. And, uh, you know, those kind of practices are very powerful and any, any number of things, uh, you know, talismans can be very powerful, um, you know, there's all kinds of ways to avoid spiritual attachment. Um, what I would say that is if you think you have one, uh, you know, try cleansing, try, you know, praying, try, uh, getting blessing communion if you're Christian or something to that effect. Um, and if you have practiced whatever other religions like smudging, as I mentioned, uh, there's many, many different practices to clean yourself of negativity. And so whatever resonates with you spiritually is how you do it. Because it's my belief, it's not so much the practice, it's the faith you have in it. That's what energizes it and makes it powerful. So do what resonates with you. And uh, yeah, those are great ways to cleanse yourself of any attachments. And, you know, there are certainly people out there that can help you with that as well, um, whether they're shamanistic or religious figures or, you know, clergy or whatever. There's all kinds of methodologies. So there's no one way. There's many, many, many ways, you know. So just Good my, point. just my thoughts, but again, um, I, go ahead. I was just going to say, I don't want to talk like, gee, I got this all figured out. Pull up a chair and listen. Cause I'm going to teach you. <laughs> I, I don't pretend to be able to teach anybody. I can only share what I think, what my ideas are. They work for me, but uh, you know, again, it may not work for all of you. I don't know. It's only my personal experience that I draw on and, and I openly share that with you, but uh, I can't pretend to know for sure. Those are just what I believe. Just not, that's, that's right. My, that's my big disclaimer because, you know, 
I don't I don't want to pretend like I got it all figured out because believe me, <laughs> I'm I'm thumping through this life like a pinball like everybody else. So <laughs> currently, there's just no way to know for sure. Yeah, <laughs> on any right. of this. So. Yeah, exactly. But it's whatever you um, believe in. I think the power of faith is incredibly powerful. Like whatever you have faith in, that becomes incredibly profound. So use it. Yeah. What were you gonna say? Um, Android Purity says uh, Bishop James Long on YouTube and Ghost Adventures says the oppression stage from a demon has the goal of keeping you awake because when you're sleep deprived, it can possess you easier. You know, certainly losing sleep is one way. There's many ways. Um, it's just creating anxiety, fears, feels of feelings of anxiety, creating um, any way that you can weaken, be weakened. It'll, you know, causes people to want to push away people around them like they're agitated all the time. Um, just think of think of possession like any other abusive relationship. Abusers want to isolate the person they're abusing. And so these entities will work to isolate you from everything that might make you strong. So, um, again, I don't think, I think that demons are incredibly intelligent. They have nothing but time. And you have to be very careful because the word demon gets thrown around really recklessly. Like in the paranormal communities, everybody, oh, it's a demon. I dealt with a demon over at the Smith place. And, you know, because it's like street cred. It's like it sounds really cool. But quite honestly, you know, God, God willing, none of you will ever encounter one of those. They're just horribly dark, twisted things that just want nothing but your destruction. And uh, I would just say that, you don't. You generally don't know you're dealing with a demon until it's way late in the game. Like they don't want you to notice because if they can get away with being subtle and causing you to be weaker and weaker and weaker, then they can win. But you know, if they came in going, "I'm a demon. I'm going to move your cereal bowl and throw stuff around," and and uh, <laughs> then you're going to know and you can fight back before you're in any jeopardy. So, I think that they are a very crafty thing, and. Uh, they don't broadcast their presence until by the time you realize you're dealing with something that is that that profoundly dark. It's very late in the game. So anyway, just my thoughts. Another way to look at like spirits that are throwing stuff around is they're just having a tantrum. Like I, I I've been calling them like tantrum spirits lately. Like they're just throwing stuff around. Like yeah, I want to get my way. <laughs> Let me possess you. <laughs> no, I, I mean I, I don't know. It's, it's possible. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's in a lot of cases, they just want to be noticed. Like if they're throwing stuff around, no. they just want to be acknowledged. Yeah. You know, imagine how that, how maddening that would be to be like stuck in somebody's room. Like this is the place where you've got to be and <laughs> nobody acknowledges you. How, how would that, how would um, that go? Is there mental, you know mental You're illness? Right. I, is there mental yeah. illness for spirits? And, and, you know, maybe there is, I don't know. Maybe you can go crazy slowly. It's hard to good say. Point. Yeah. That's a good point. But anyway, we, we ended up going through almost that whole segment <laughs> of just me talking. I, and I, I hope you guys don't mind. I mean, I don't mind sharing this stuff. I'll talk about whatever you guys want to. But, um, you know, again, I, I don't pretend to know anything for sure. I just, this is what I believe. And that's the only, you know, the only, the only perspective I have is my own. So I'm just sharing with you what, I, what I've learned and what seems to make sense to me. And if it doesn't to you, then, you know, you're perfectly perfectly uh right and just going ah what a bunch of bunk because you could be right i could be absolutely wrong it's true <sighs> but i'm right for me <laughs> ah. if, if that makes any sense i don't know but it is my way um we're gonna be going to the next break already wow oh Thank, my god that was a great call though thanks for calling in ruger it's good to hear from you yeah. and ladies and gentlemen the phones are open if you want to call in 720-923-0500 is how you get through if you want to talk to us we'd love to hear from you but otherwise in the chats just let us know and let's let us know you're there when we come back we'll do shout outs too so if you want to shout out make sure to type something just after at the end of the break so that your name gets populated on the list in youtube because I don't, I don't get a, an active, it only, it only gives me a list of active chatters. So, uh, if we minded, we wouldn't ask. Thank you, cold stairs. I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate true. it. Yeah. Yeah. True. So, um, but we're about a minute out right now. Um, one other thing, the podcast comes out tomorrow night, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be releasing a new podcast. So 
keep your eyes out for that. Don is going to be working on it tomorrow and getting it ready for distribution. And it will be an interview that I did with uh, Charles Howard Johnson, who is a paranormal encrypted researcher out of Spokane, Washington. And actually, in the, in the future, we're going to be collaborating, and I'm going to be joining him on some investigations, and we'll be doing that as live as I can to all of you. So we could be possibly airing investigations live um, from different locations as that becomes available to us. So that's in the works. There's lots of stuff in the works right now, ladies and gentlemen. But remember, uh, another thing, please make sure to spread the word about the po- Paranormal Portal because we're literally um, at about 175 people away from 10,000. So uh, roughly, I mean, it, it bounces around. But generally, we're, we're under 200 right now. We need less than 200 subscribers for 10,000. And once we hit that benchmark, we're going to have a huge Paranormal Portal celebration, giveaways, and more. So spread the word. We'll be right back. Last segment coming up.
song. What the hell is that? <laughs> it's what they sing. They're like, ee. Yeah, I know. I, I wrote it. Thanks. <laughs> it's the E song. <laughs> it's not the E song. <laughs> oh, my God. I think your mother dropped you on your head when you were a baby. <laughs> no, that was you, actually. No, I never dropped you. I never, ever would drop you. Uh, well, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Last half hour is upon us here on the Paranormal Portal. And uh, this is our last segment of the night. Wow. It's flown by. Absolutely flown always by. Always does. It always does, doesn't it? Okay. Yeah. I'm going to read one more from this list, and then we'll get to some uh, Phantoms and Monsters reports. There's no more of the calls, so we're good to go. So, are you ready for more, Sheldon? Always. All right, the next story is coming from that same list on roughmaps.com. Uh, creepiest trucker stories, and uh, this one is The Hills Have Eyes. My friend was driving on a Mexican road at night. He felt the call of nature. <laughs> I hate that call. So he parked on the sideway and jumped off the truck, and he walked to relieve himself, and while he was doing that, he felt a presence beside him. He pointed his flashlight at his side and saw standing beside him a small, deformed person. It was naked and had both its head and face bloated. Ooh. He was, <laughs> he was just standing there. My friend ran away to his truck, jumped in, and drove away from there. Wow. Um... Oh, that's kind of a abrupt story. It's like he saw this creepy guy and left. The end. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it was written by a by a fifth grader or something. Um, no, I <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's, it's like there there should be more. Okay, he saw a bloated face and stuff, but what did it make a noise? Did it stand there just yeah. watching him? Well, what Dude. were you doing? How did you see it? Yeah, well, how did you react when you saw it? Yeah. Then what you did do? Not just like feel. well, <laughs> it's it's a friend story, my friend story. But you'd oh, still you'd expect. Yeah. I mean, I'd have a ton of questions for that. Okay, look, what did it look like? It was little and bloated. What does that mean? You know, um, I don't know that. But that was by Charlie Vasquez. So I don't know. We don't really know much more. So I'm gonna actually, um, actually, at this point, uh, yeah, I'll read this one. It says, the woman in white. My Costa Rican tour guide told us a really scary story that happened to a former employee of his who would drive a truck filled with construction materials. They were building uh, miles away from the nearest city, so since a lot of Costa Rica is preserved jungle. Anyway, this dude was the first, not the only, person to have this happen to him. He was driving behind a line of construction trucks on their way to the site that night. He saw a white, pale woman throw herself in the way of the trucks in front of him. He yelled into their radio to stop and check for her, but when they stopped, they didn't find a body or blood, and no one had ever seen her except for him. This happened again and yet again. When they stopped, they couldn't find the girl, and no one except the guy who called it saw anything. The other workers thought he was losing it or something. One other time, he had to go out to the site by himself at night, and it had been some time after the incident with the pale woman, so he didn't think it was a big deal. He exited the car at one point to take a... <laughs> here he is. Man, when nature calls, all kinds of things go sideways. Uh, to take a leak near a clearing, and that's when he felt it starting to get really cold. He turned around, and peering out from a tree, in the distance he saw the same pale woman standing, staring at him. Dude booked it back to his car and got in the driver's seat, turned it on, and was about to speed the heck out of there when he took one last look at his left side rearview mirror. He saw her much closer and still looking at him. He kept that story to himself, thinking no one would believe him until a new worker claimed to see the same thing and told my tour guide, who was their boss at the time. When the boss told the truck driver that the new guy saw, the truck driver told him, about the second encounter with the woman in the forest. Creepy, creepy stuff all around. Yeah. It seems like that is such a common thing, this this lone woman apparitions. I don't know, but that was by A.J. A. De Leon. De Leon. Um, interesting stories all around. Um, I did say I was going to do shout-outs, so let's see who's here on TFR. We got Bam420, Marky Mark 85 Gemini is there, and great guest is there as well. Great to see you guys. Thank you so much for being here. And on the YouTubes, we got 
if you want a shout out, hope you're chatting. Because here it comes time. Cold Stairs, Digger Dog, Eliza, GG, Ghost Magnet, 81, JG, Hartwell. Uh, oops, somebody just popped in. Eliza, I think, in the lane. Okay. Um, JG Hartwell, Maggie M10, Matthew Learned, Rachel got it, gets it right, Ruger Ridge, Sheldon, you're here. Someone else came in. Brooks. Brooks. Okay, Brooks is there. Okay. Very good. And someone else came in. Daryl Zierlin came in. David Pierce came in. Good to see you guys. Thank you so much. And uh, I think, well, that's everybody that's chatting right now. Thank you guys for being here and being a part of the deal. The deal meaning the show. So I want to get into a few reports from Phantoms and Monsters. Of course, this is Lon Strickler's site. And uh, he does a great job not only as a repository for claims of people uh, having confronted the uh, paranormal and unknown, but also as uh, an investigative arm. They have uh, an investigative arm of, their, of what they're doing, so they actually go out and investigate these cryptid stories as well, which is phenomenal. They're doing some uh, dogman research in Pennsylvania. They're doing the Mothman or winged humanoid research up in uh, Illinois, and there's, they've got things going on everywhere, so it's really cool. And you can find more. Uh, they also have a podcast. Lon has a podcast, and he's been a guest on, on our show a few times now. But uh, the podcast is, used to be called Arcane Radio, but it's now called Phantoms and Monsters Radio. So, again, support phantomsandmonsters.com. Go over there and check it out. And a special <laughs> thanks to Lon for letting us use the, the site. What? It's just... Uh, it started a trend. Everybody's, you know, people are starting to say E in the oh, chat. Well, here to go, Shelton. All <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here's the first one tonight. And this is aquatic humanoid encounters in Florida and Indonesia. Now, I think of all the places to experience a humanoid monster, probably one of the most disconcerting is in the water because I think that's where we're the most helpless. I mean, oh, not, yeah. not that you could do much against a dogman or a Bigfoot either you know, or anything of that nature, but it just feels like, you know, you might have an opportunity to get away or something if you're on land. If you're in water and you're being kept from breathing, you're done. I mean, you're done it's in over. seconds. Yeah. I mean, it's such a, such a, a foreign place for us to be. And these, these, uh, uh, these experiences are just horrifying. But let's get into these and see what's going on. It says, an Indonesian fisherman reported an incident that he and his crew had in the, in the waters off of Florida. Really? An Indonesian fisherman off of Florida. Okay. He later recalled an orang ikan. Orang meaning, well, means people. Um, and uh, ikan is fish, so fish people. Uh, a humanoid merman supposedly encountered in his homeland. Several years ago, an Indonesian fisherman who was living in Miami, Miami, Florida, contacted me about an encounter that he and his crew had approximately five miles out to sea. They'd left Fort Lauderdale earlier in the day and were making their way to an area where they regularly fished. As they were about to drop their net, a humanoid creature about three feet in length popped to the surface, then vanished back into the depths. The same scenario repeated itself twice more, each time in a different location near the boat. They attempted to capture a photograph of this being, but were frustrated at each opportunity. The description given to me was a finned creature with a human-like head and a dorsal ray extending from the top of the head down the back. There was a, a tail of some type, but nothing definitive was seen. The color of the finned humanoid was light red with bits of green. Wow. Okay. The fishermen were quite shocked by the incidents and feared that this was a sign of danger. They quickly left the location and returned back to shore. The fisherman who contacted me went by the name of Thomas, and he was quite adamant that he and his crew had witnessed an actual mermaid. He then proceeded to tell me about the beliefs associated with the aquatic humanoids in his native country of Indonesia. Residents of that nation believe in the reality of these cryptids, Thomas recalled an account where he had heard decades earlier this aquatic creature encounter occurred during a military training exercise in Jakarta Bay. 
At the time, the soldier witnesses uh, the soldier witnesses had described that the creatures had hands and faces like a human man, but the mouths were very wide and similar to the mouth of a carp. The length of these creatures was about five feet. Their skin was pink, and on his head were spikes. Unlike classic mermaids, these beings had ordinary human legs, not fish-like tails. They briskly shoaled near the witnesses. I'm not sure what shoaled means, but anyway, if that's like coming out of the water or something, I don't know. At first, the, the soldiers believed that these people were these were people swimming, but when one of the creatures turned to face them, they noticed that the features are not human. Immediately after that, the creatures plunged headlong into the water and disappeared from view. The witnesses looked at the water for a while, but the creatures never reappeared. Yeah, I find these reports really incredible about mermen. And it mer- wouldn't mer- surprise people. me, not yeah. at all. Well, I mean, you know, what do they say? We've re- we've explored like five or fifteen percent of the ocean. That's I think not, it's like ten, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not much. When the soldiers met with several of the fishermen at shore and asked them about these sea creatures, they said that these creatures are called orang ikan. Orang means people, and ikan is a fish. Yeah, I knew that. In another incident, a police commander was summoned to a village west of Jakarta. When the commander arrived, he was told that a dead orangutan was found and was moved to a hut of the head of the village. The commander went to examine the body. He described the creature was 150 centimeters in length with reddish shoulder-length hair. The neck was covered in sharp thorns and the face was hideous and resembled the face of a monkey. It had a short nose, a low forehead, and small ears. The mouth had no lips and was wide as the face, and the teeth in the mouth were small but sharp as needles. The fingers on the hands and feet of the creatures were webbed, and the rest of the body was covered in tufts of algae. The commander could not understand what this creature was, and of what species it belonged. Never before had he had heard about these creatures, and it frightened him. No photos were taken. Many people outside the village questioned the validity of the claims. The commander was later relieved of his duties. Thomas told me that he believes the account and that he heard of other sightings throughout his life. He said that his father was also a fisherman and that he recalled an incident with the Orang Ikan by Japanese shoulders during the occupation. Yeah, that's pretty wild. Could they be out there? Um, I remember when that, that mockumentary came around. That oh yeah, showed I, yep. mm-hmm. I, you know I was I really didn't understand what was going on then. I'd never heard the the title mockumentary before, but I watched it and I was like, wow, could it be? Is this could be real? What the hell's going? But then it, it surfaced that it was a that was just a con job, and I was so disgusted by that. It's like why why are you guys doing this? Yeah, it, it was <clears throat> pointless. I don't. There was no point to that. Right. I mean, if it was just a dramatization of claims, that's cool. But it was just this fabricated narrative of the scientist uncovering mermen or mer people, and it's, it's it was just so tragically, I don't know, really frustrating. Yeah. Uh, and they done they've done another one about the what was the other one that they did was about the megalodon. They did one about the megalodon as well, and it's like why play with that? Why? Why make up fake documentaries about things like that, that obviously they don't believe exist or believe are real, but they create these weird false narratives. And I mean, no, I don't think anybody was pleased about that. I don't, I never heard anybody go, God, I watched that and it was really cool. I'm so glad they made it. (laughs) It's like, no, everybody was pissed. It was like, why are they making fun of it? So I don't know whatever you believe, but I think they could be out there. There's a lot of ocean we don't know about. And uh, honestly, well, we're, Brooks, we're, Brooks says, uh, and they have found fish with spears in them. None like anybody has seen thinking that mermaids hunt hunting tools. Oh, well, I, I now I, I, I do remember hearing that claim, but I think that was part of the mockumentary, but maybe it's true. Oh, maybe it's oh, true. No. But I, I did actually, I think that was part of that show. Where they oh, said no. they, they brought up, oh, there's these strange fish were you know found with these real rudimentary spears that nobody can figure out where they came from. And, oh, no. and you know, I don't know, but I think that might be part of the mockumentary. I'm not saying it's not true. And, and if it is, I, I, honestly, I would love for it to be true because, again, I love, I love the paranormal. I love believing that these things could be out there. So 
Um, yeah. I want it to be true. I just don't know if it is. And, um, you know, I appreciate you sharing that information. It could be if there's actual reports like that. And if you become aware of those reports, send them to me. I'd love to see them because, you know, this is, this is my passion. This is what I love. And we're going to go to another one now from Phantoms and Monsters. This is a new one from February 19th. Uh, horned hippopotamus-like creature of San Miguel Lagoon, Cuba. So I'd not heard about this one before, but it's horned hippopotamus-like creature. Oh, yes! As if the normal hippopotamus weren't bad enough. Oh God! Now yeah. there's some with horns. <laughs> Let's see what it says. There have been several versions of this incident since 1971. Wow, it goes way back. The San Miguel Lagoon cryptid was reported from a, sub a suburb of Havana, Cuba, as a horned hippopotamus-like creature. In 1971, the unusual creature was spotted in a lagoon outside of Havana, Cuba. The lagoon, a flooded quarry, is located in San Miguel del Padron, a suburb of Havana. Rumors of a frightening creature quickly spread throughout Havana. Crowds of curious onlookers flocked to the lagoon. As news of the monster spread, the masses grew. Crowds that were once in the hundreds quickly es escalated to thousands in numbers. The creature created such a buzz within the community that the government-ran radio station op Radio Progresso took an interest and sent reporters to investigate. The, corresponding descended, the correspondents descended upon the scene. They examined eyewitness reports and interviewed witnesses. Descriptions of the creature vary. Some describe it as a spindle shape with large and threatening yellow eyes, and others claimed to see a horned hippopotamus-like animal with a featureless face, according to one witness who claimed to have seen the animal on multiple occasions, it doesn't look like anything but a black ball that maybe resembles a hippopotamus with horns. But it doesn't really resemble any animal, and has got no eyes on it at all. One of the reports sent to investigate the run of the reporters, rather, sent to investigate the phenomena, saw the creature for himself. He claimed to see something rise from the water amid intense bubbling. Whatever this animal was, it had a rough texture and a rounded shape, and after it surfaced, it floated for a few seconds, then sank back into the water. Wow. <clears throat> if some of the stories about the monsters are true, then we have a very strange creature, one that may have psychic abilities. Rumors tell of an elderly man who lived in a ramshackle home by the lagoon that was driven crazy by the monster, according to the story. After the man encountered the creature, he fled in terror. The poor man had gone mad instantaneously and later hanged himself from a tree. Aww. Word spread of the monster's mind-bending abilities. Many of the folks who ventured to the, lag the lagoon shielded their eyes, careful not to make eye contact with the creature, fearful of its dreaded gaze. Mystery Monster. The Dispatch, Lexington, North Carolina, August 23rd, 1971. Uh, the now distant year 1971 was coming to an end in the city of San Crist Cristobal de la Habana when a strange event happened. A horrible monster appeared in the lagoon on the outlying municipality of San Miguel de, de Patron. I remember the morning when the number 10 bus I rode to get to my classes at the University of Havana was left practically empty after almost all of its riders got off at a stop in Giacomino, a neighboring neighborhood of San Miguel de, de Padron. When I inquired about this strange mass behavior, someone said to me, there's a monster in a lagoon back there, pointing with arm outstretched in the direction of the aforementioned body of water. In the days that followed, I began putting together piece by piece the unlikely story of the creature from San Miguel Lagoon, it was said to be an aquatic or subaquatic monster, spindle shaped, uh, possibly spindle shaped, and with that, what might be large and threatening yellow eyes. It had surfaced in the quiet, boring waters of that lagoon, and its gaze had brought madness to an old man who lived in a wretched lakeside hovel. According to some versions of the story, when the old man saw the monster, he ran away terrified and his sudden derangement led him to hang himself in the nearest tree. I tried to find out the locale or national uh, news newspapers had reported this incident, but I could not find a single word about the frightening monster. However, the news ran like wildfire through eastern Havana, and soon the number of curiosity seekers rose from a few dozen 
to a few hundred and eventually thousands of people were visiting the lagoon with fear and excitement, hoping to catch a glimpse of that creature. People arrived in very large groups at the clearing where the lagoon was. It had become a tropical nest, Loch Ness, and they said that one brave soul, an elderly gentleman, even drove in, dove into its dark waters, knife in hand like St. George from, from Havana, determined to slay once for and for all the, the Cappadocia dragon, or at least the new San Miguel Nessie. And, and because the monster had special power of diving to ins- driving to insanity anyone who looked directly into its eyes, many of the curious brave souls who came to find it in the afternoon, by then it was known that Nessie preferred evening shows, would cover their eyes with fear as soon as any fan or joker would yell, Monster! Uh, the crowd would stampede in every direction except the lake, of course. As time went by, just how long it was, I couldn't say. A brief story appeared in one of the national newspapers under the headline, The Creature from the San Miguel Lagoon. Under it was a photo of one or maybe two, I can't quite remember, frogmen with the thick trunk of a royal palm tree at their feet on the shore of the lake. The terrible monster was nothing more than that, a simple mundane dried palm tree that was floating on the surface of the lagoon or perhaps drifting from its depths to the surface, depending on the whims of the lagoon's underwater currents. What a disappointment. Reality had revealed itself to be so shockingly insipid that it had left the popular imagination looking ridiculous. Carpenter was right after all. We are a people immersed in magical realism. In other words, we experience the fantastic and the strange as though it were real and routine. That was from the creature from the San Miguel Lagoon, Solar Magazine, June 1st, 2012. So, I, you know, I got to admit, as I was reading that, I was, I was thinking about, you know, the idea, what if it's a log and it's very waterlogged and it's somewhat buoyant and kind of comes to the surface every once in a while, then goes back down um, mm-hmm. because of the bulbous, you know, the, the spindle shape is what kind of, kind of made me think of that. It's like, well, you know, a log's kind of spindle shaped. And of course, you know, that's what a lot of people attribute many of the Nessie sightings to is just a waterlogged log that's kind of popping up a root or something coming up and then going back down, you know, so is that possible? And I think it certainly is. I don't think you can dismiss that. But the other part of it was, is this is kind of why I hope a part of me hopes that Bigfoot is never substantiated because this is one sighting of one monster, and it started with dozens, then went to hundreds, and then to thousands of people flocking there, hoping to get a glimpse. So what do you suppose is going to happen when, when Bigfoot is substantiated? Oh. You know, it'd be, yeah. it'd be tens of thousands of people hitting the woods looking for their glimpse. You We've know. been hunters, yeah. you know, going out hunting. Well, you know, and, and that, that may or may not be, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's just the fact that people are, you know, so incredibly curious that it would drive droves of people to come to these wild places and just stomp all over the the natural beauty trying to see one for themselves like yeah, it's like true. it's a new petting zoo or something so i don't know i'm kind of torn on it but at any rate it's a thought it's a thought to consider but yeah, as much as much as i love all the all the cryptids you know i mean i'm i'm i am at peace knowing that they're hidden from humans you know? <laughs> in a sense i'm at peace with it <laughs> well you know there's there's two sides of it it's like yeah i mean i'm curious i'd love I, there's some parts of me that would love this to be substantiated because of course the amount of ridicule that people that believe in this stuff can endure at the you know in the at the hands of oh you guys are so full of crap it's like you know the ufo's we're all seen by, you know, basically tinfoil hat wearing people as far as, you know, the population was concerned until the Navy released those videos and said, oh, whoop. And then it just became, oh, yeah, there's strange things in the skies. We don't know what they are. And suddenly it became a possibility that, yeah, there are strange craft in the sky. We don't know what they are. And so yeah. it, there would be that, the vindication, I guess, of the believers, like, you know, instead of making fun of people all the time, just there's it's possible there are things out there we don't know. And, uh, you know, we're learning more all the time. So at any rate, that's the magic of the paranormal, folks. Exactly. It's the paranormal. <clears throat> but we just got a little bit of time left, Sheldon. So I want to let people know. I think the best way for you guys to keep in touch with us and the community in general is to join our Discord Right there in the chat. Um, lots of great links um, 
lots of great discussions. Um, yeah, if you guys want to chat, any questions, or want to post anything, talk with other people, go ahead and, and join the Discord. Check out the Discord, folks. It's out there. And uh, I haven't been on there for a while, but I was on there today and, and posted something and, and just said hello. I, I had to close for so long because I was sick for a while. I couldn't deal with, deal with it anyway. And I was having, before that, I was having some, some malware on my computer that I was chasing down. So I was cutting off everything I could. But I finally fired it up again. And there's a lot of discussions that have been happening that I missed. So I got some catching up to do. But, ladies and gentlemen, that's oh. the bell. So uh, just remember, we love you all. Be good, be kind, be nice. Take care of each other. Help each other out. Find the magic in every day and remember to laugh as much as you can. So we'll see you guys later. Take care. Have a great night. Until Wednesday. <laughs>